All right, so it is now, once again, my pleasure to introduce you all to the first keynote for today, Alex Zafiriglou from the Australian National University School of Cybernetics. She completed her PhD in cultural anthropology at Brown University in 2004, and then spent 15 very productive years at Intel in the US, working in R&D and commercial development of technology across advanced research, digital home, digital home and internet of things divisions. She's a co-inventor on 11 patents, and was appointed principal engineer in social science within the Internet of Things division. She also um, came to the 3A Institute, which is now part of the School of Cybernetics in 2020 as a professor. So I get to work with her. Um, she is currently deputy director of the school. Uh, she's PhD program convener, which is the role that I get to work with her on, which is awesome. And she has many, many other roles. So she will be kicking things off for us today with a talk titled Hard Yards and Malleable Motions realizing cobotics. Thank you very much for joining us today, Alex. Thank you, Liz, for the nice introduction. I'm going to do my best now to share my screen. Thank you so much for your patience. Um, good morning, everybody. I am Alex Zafiriglou. Uh, the work that I'm going to talk about today, and am I too loud or too soft, Liz? You're perfect. I'm You're perfect. perfect. Okay. Um, is work that is currently unfolding and it is in collaboration with several researchers in the School of Cybernetics and across the College of Engineering, Computing and Cybernetics, including Mina Henin, uh, Joining Zhu, who is also on the line. So if there's any questions, I bet Joining can answer them as well. Uh, Ellen O'Brien and Brenda Martin. And really importantly, this is a um, talk that I'm giving that is based on a ongoing collaboration with the Australasian Dance Collective, and in particular, the collective's artistic director, Amy Hollingsworth, and their entire creative team. So um, uh, taking, to the, taking to heart the idea of interdisciplinarity, the ideas that we are creating together is what I am sharing, and my name may be at the top, but I think all of these people are co-authoring these ideas with me. Um, I will be the third person to do an acknowledgement of country. I do want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which my ideas about human computer, excuse me, human machine collaboration are unfolding. I'm joining you from Nunawal and Nambri land, a uh, land that is always sacred and never ceded. I pay my respects to their elders past and present. And we are gathering via Zoom from many parts of the world to explore and discuss the possibilities of new ways of relating with technologies that we create. And I recognize and I draw inspiration from the place that has nurtured conversations about connections and relationships with the systems which we are part of and which we are, uh, which we create for more than um, 30,000 years. So to give a little bit of context about the project that I'm working on, um, it is a little bit of an addendum or an ongoing component of a collaboration with the Australasian Dance Collective and a project that they have called Lucy in the Sky. Now it's Lucy with an IE and it refers to these tiny little quadcopter drones that are called Lucy's. And um, Amy Hollingsworth has been working on this project for about six years, and it involves um, 11 characters on a stage. Six of them are human dancers and five of them are drones. And what is being realized on the stage is uh, the expression of an emotional connection between the human dancers and the drones. And so I've pulled a little bit of the language that Amy is using from um, their, their excellent website. You can learn a lot more about the project on their website. And I'll just point out a few things. One is that uh, Amy is working to choreograph the drones using human movement patterns to emulate emotions and personality. So there are personalities for the dancers and there are personalities for the drones. And those are realized with the drones um, particularly through um, kinesics and proxemics to the dancers, as well as uh, the use of lighting. Um, and she's really interested in, can the uh, human dancers endow the, the robotic system um, with, uh, with emotion, basically? Um, and she calls it endowment, and I'm going to call that uh, becoming with. So I'm going to switch between those words as we're talking to um, see how the perspectives that we are bringing from the School of Cybernetics mix with the perspectives that are coming from the um, from the ABC, which is the Australasian Dance Collective. 
Um, and she's really interested in thinking about what are the relationships that we could model dyad interactions with. So uh, uh, react, uh, a relationship between a single dancer and a single drone. And here you're seeing she's talking about power and deep-seated need and relationships with one another, including as peers, companions, friends, and foes. Um, and for our part, our collaboration with the ADC is really about thinking about the arts as a place where complex systems and their elements and their interactions are often framed and reframed for public audiences. We know that many art forms powerfully shape our presence and our future. And most often we tend to think at the, the moment about science fiction as a form of art and that science fiction will often hopefully turn into science fact. Um, but we also see dance and performance arts as another place that can inform how we shape and how we build systems with which we interact and how we design technologies for the future. Now, of course, in the history of cybernetics and in the ways that the school is reinvigorating cybernetics for the 21st century, the arts have actively informed, shaped, and created relationships between people, the technology systems that we create, and the environments in which we place them. And I'm often, I often think about Oscar Wilde's um, famous quit quip from 1889, um, that life imitates art far more than art imitates life. Um, and here we're really thinking about what can we learn about dance and the way that dance is realized um, that may inform how we think about designing relationships between people and cobots. And so really, the big question we have was, how does Lucy provide models to think about and steer the design of future systems? Um, and in particular between people and cobots. And I'm, I'm being really careful here when I say people, because I don't mean humans in this kind of disembodied universal, you just come to the world um, in a narrow interaction sense between a human and a system, but really everything that it means to be a person, including all of our, um, all of the culture that we bring with us, all the ideas that we bring with us, and here I'm also using um, the word cobots intentionally. And by cobots, I mean um, robotic systems that will work, um, as was mentioned earlier, in super close physical proximity um, with a person to realize um, a goal or accomplish a goal. And what we're interested in is both how does that happen? What's the work that's involved in that? What are the models for relationships that Amy is thinking about and that we can help inform her about? But also, how do these um, relationships um, and these kind of becoming together, how does that happen in a way that is understandable or legible to other people that are watching it unfold? So it's not enough just to accomplish a goal, but to accomplish a goal in a way that everyone else kind of goes, oh, I got it, I get what's going on there. So you'll see here that I've been a little bit um, focused on relationships, and we're really interested in this project about the concept of becoming with. And we think that these relationships between cobots and the human dancers matter because it's through these relationships that we become human. Now, autonomous systems or semi-autonomous systems like drones often capture our imaginations as offering opportunities to engage with artificial or non-biological agents that act independently of our immediate actions and instructions. And it's especially true for systems that physically move and interact with their environments like a drone. And our imaginings are often deflated when we recognize that the apparent agency of the drones or a self-driving car or a robot is enabled not so much through magic as by engineered systems developed by teams of people. And that the extra biological characteristics of these teams, so not just the fact that they're human, but they're particular types of humans, so the cultural and the social and the economic and the political values and the beliefs and practices, inform their models for interaction between the people and the autonomous systems that they create, more so than does the fact that they happen to be human. Um, and so if we think about how we define what it means to be human happening in relationship with other agents or with others that have the ability to act, um, we begin to um, think a little bit more broadly about what it means to be a human and what it means to become a human as an ongoing process. And here we're drawing on Donna Haraway's argument that 
um, and I'm quoting her here, if we appreciate the foolishness of human exceptionalism, then we know that becoming is always becoming with. And our question here is how do we become with these drones? Um, and if we think about it this way, it helps us recognize that when we become human, happens in relationship with other agents. Um, it could be anything from other people to other species like dogs and cats and plants or even uh, viruses um, or other categories such as uh, robots or um, AI systems. And so another way of asking this could actually be, um, how do we act in the world and what systems shape our movements and we shape theirs? How do we kind of become with them? And we asked this recently, actually, we asked it yesterday because we did a, a um, session, an interactive session about this project with a broad group of people. And we asked people, what are systems that you move with and that move with you um, and kind of become with you? And we got answers from everything from revolving doors. So adjusting your body to what they are doing, uh, robotic vacuums, um, magpies, which if you live outside of Australia, you may not realize um, are out to get you on your bicycle. Um, if you get near them during um, nesting season, they will swoop you quite aggressively. And so you have to learn how to how to move and be safe um, during particular types of year. We also heard about things like bicycles and insulin pumps. Um, but here, our first really big question for this project is, what are the models um, for intimate relationships between a COBA and a person that we can consider? And so we've had a series of ongoing conversations um, with Amy and also talking with her about why these might matter for the types of the futures that we envision. Um, and we have three kind of big research questions, and then we've gone from these big research questions that you're seeing here, this is research question one, to a series of smaller questions that we're currently grappling with and currently working through. Um, and it's at this level of these smaller questions that I wanted to share some of our, our thoughts today. Um, our first kind of mini question based on thinking about these models really is, um, what are the models of the relationships that Amy's drawing on and how are these embodied? And here we're thinking very much about that all models are cultural. And so what is it that, that the ADC is bringing here? What is it that the um, indoor drone company that they're partnering with are bringing to the table? And how do we think about power and relationships? Um, and when we're foregrounding, kind of collaborative or COBA rather than just drone system and human, um, we are creating room to think about different models for becoming with, ones that are more egalitarian perhaps than the ones that we tend to use when we think of things like smart home assistants that are there to answer questions for us and do things for us. We might think about dyad relationships that are more like partners or colleagues or friends. Um, or lovers or cousins or members of the same gaggle of geese or the same anarcho-syndicalist association um, or species in mutualist symbiosis in a reef ecosystem or workers in an ant colony. Um, they're kind of good to think with, but we can also foreground the potential challenges with which agent has the authority to make decisions that impacts both of them. So kind of who is if they're dancing together, who is leading and who is following? And how does that dance of agency play out um, over time? So when we're applying these models of intimate COBA interactions to the relationship between drones and humans, you may think eh, it doesn't really work because drones are things that are very high up in the sky and um, not things that are very close to the body. And yeah, the word drone has historically been associated with a uh, worker, like an insect or a human. And this definition informs how we've imagined uh, robotic drones as autonomous in a quite limited sense that they're pre-programmed with instructions to accomplish a task that we think is like too risky, too dirty, or too slow to be performed by a more powerful agent, like a human being who has set up the rules. But uh, modern drones are also agents that act almost entirely according to preset plans and instructions with feedback from the local environment and from distant operators and coworkers. And in this sense, drones are generally used not as cobots, um, if you're thinking about the ones that do um, surveillance or other activities, 
Um, besides in the context of takeoffs and landings, when uh, workers get human workers get quite close to them, and they operate at decidedly non-intimate distances um, to their coworkers. Um, but here we're really thinking about through the constructed world of performance that is being explored in Lucy, um, we have the opportunity to subvert some of the existing modes of relating between a human and a drone pair. And the dance choreography is constructing a pairing between the dancer and the drone in which movements and interactions are informed about ideas about personality and affect or emotion. And this project's um, the individual drones, as I said, are going to perform full embodiments of, of self-possession and, um, and uh, hopefully, um, which is what Amy calls endowment, um, uh, emotional expression. And so by endowing the performative drones with full agency, um, the creative director is introducing a new grammar for a human drone pairing. So it's a grammar created by the rhythms of the movement and the interaction of the dancers and the drones, super close proximity. And um, these choreographed dances invite us to consider alternate models of intimacy and several possible futures for people to design, build, and live among and with autonomous agents. So at the moment, we are doing things like pouring over uh, notebooks full of creative materials that Amy has been, uh, excuse me, that Amy has written up, as you can see on the screen. Um, we also just spent um, two weeks in Zurich uh, and then about another week in Brisbane, watching a lot of the brainstorming sessions and the rehearsals uh, with either just the dancers or with the human dancers and the drones or just the rehearsals of uh, the drones um, moving on the, on the dance floor. So um, our second question that we're investigating is really about like, okay, how does it all come together? How does it work and what relationships and processes and dynamics are needed to successfully bring together the really big diversity of knowledge and skills and materials to make um, this becoming with happen or make this endowment happen. And here um, we've realized big question, lots of people to talk to and lots of people to interview, lots of people to observe everything from the, the artistic director to the rehearsal manager, to the dancers, the human dancers, um, to the drone choreographers, um, who are not actually control engineers, but are drone choreographers, which is a point I'll get back to in a minute, because it's a very different model than we might be thinking about, um, to the production managers, the product managers, and everyone in between. Um, and as we started to do this, what we've realized is one of the biggest challenges um, in this project is that you have dancers and artistic company based in Brisbane, and then you have a um, indoor drone uh, team based in Zurich. And so figuring out how to communicate, how to enact these relationships um, when the teams and the resources, when I say resources, I mean things like dancers and drones are really, really far flung. And so what you're seeing here is a bit of the um, rehearsals that have been happening in uh, Brisbane, for the most part, not with the floor mapped out with tape, um, but towards the end with a floor mapped out in tape, um, and then creating lots and lots of videos that the dancers have sent to the drone choreography team so they can understand how they might begin to do the motion pathways for the drones. You're also seeing Amy standing there um, with a Pilates ball, and there she is, there she goes, um, and the dancers are um, figuring out the choreography, and that is the drone, and they're um, sending all of this stuff uh, to, the, to the drone team. Now, it turns out, even with all the shipping of the videos back and forth and shipping of schematics and imagining from the schematic what the drone's going to look like, and even videos of the drones in flight, um, it's really hard to get across what should be happening. Um, and you need both language, so kind of spoken language and video. And most importantly, you need dialogue and discussion to be able to effectively iterate and get feedback and get closer and closer to that moment of endowment. 
And um, one of the most surprising things is that we're hearing so far is like the videos were great, but sometimes we just needed a little bit more um, language or talking about what was happening so that we could understand what was happening with, with, the, with the videos. Now, the second question that's come up is, how do these teams um, communicate when they have really diverse skills and expertise? And here you're, hopefully it's gonna go forward. Yep, it's gone forward, uh, click it. Um, that a lot of this is just learning how to be um, and to talk to each other. This has come up earlier. Um, and a lot of negotiation here, you see a drone choreographer talking with Amy and Amy's looking a little bit like, I know you say that I can't do that, but I'm going to make it go even farther down and I'm going to get the result that I want. But a lot of back and forth and a lot of, um, oops, real time translation there. You saw Amy almost had a little bit of a, of a, um, accident there. Here you're also seeing how the drone choreographers are moving their bodies in order to show Amy what uh, they need. And we have Harrison and Amy going through each of the moves so that the choreographer can understand what's happening. Um, the drone choreographers will tell you that they think in math and that the dancers and the choreographer think in spatial coordinates, and it's really not the same thing. And so it can be really challenging um, to have conversations about um, how high the drone can go before it, it kind of becomes a little bit too dangerous. Or um, even if you started a uh, drone in a circle path, why it is so much more difficult to make it an ellipsis, an ellipse, and why that can take um, several hours to, to get it right before they can um, power up the drones again and get everything working. Now, our second question, I have to keep clicking forward twice to get to the next one, I apologize. Or actually, our third question is really about, um, I mentioned earlier that becoming with isn't just about accomplishing a goal together, but it's doing it in a way that everybody else kind of understands what's going on. And so we're interested in figuring out how do others understand and um, react to the thing that they are seeing that the drones and the dancers do. And we're using a variety of, of research methods here that um, we're just getting started with, including using uh, depth cameras to model some of the work that's happening. Um, but here, what I want to point out is mainly what it takes to to get um, to get the performances and to get that level of becoming with an endowment. It really comes down to learning to be and move with a robotic system, taking quite a bit of practice. Um, and in this case, it's a lot of practice to get this dancer to be comfortable being pretty much this close, um, as you can see, or this close, I should say. Um, to the drone, and it's um, lots of mutual attention and reading um, on each of the drone and the person, the person, the drone. Now, of course, these drones are pre-programmed, but what we're interested in here is not so much how is the movement realized, but what can we learn about the nature of relationships and the nature of moving together that could inform um, the use of cobots in other um, contexts. So what we've been seeing is a huge amount of mutual attention, a huge amount of focus on feedback and acting on the feedback, and a lot of uh, communication to get things right. And that's both kind of the title of the talk being hard yards, that all of that stuff takes quite a bit of time. It doesn't kind of happen overnight. It looks awkward, 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 awkward. And then when you finally get it, it becomes quite um, natural. At the same time, um, lots of practice and lots of kind of rules to follow and also being malleable or open in the moment to adjust what you're doing to fit the situation. So um, we've been thinking a lot about the types of um, mutual attention and communication that are and feedback that are required to become with something. So this is a series of experiments we've been doing in the school. And one of the things that uh, we were doing yesterday when I mentioned we talked to people about how do they move with objects. These are a few of our researchers, uh, Mina on the near side and Shuan Ying on the other side. 
um, using videos of drones in a space to think about learning how to move um, with a robotic system. And here, what we're drawing attention to is that kind of one-sided sensing, inferring, and acting is not a relationship, um, but taking practice, like this is a high school student who showed up yesterday to try this out and practice this a little bit and managed to give the impression that she had swallowed the drone and then uh, spit it uh, spit it back out. Now, here you'll see a professional dancer. This would be Amy Hollingsworth um, showing some of the techniques of thinking about how does one um, become with um, the robotic system. What you'll notice here is that sometimes she is leading the interaction with the drone, and sometimes it feels that the drone is leading. And so she's creating a relationship and a, a dialogue. It is being, you know, of course, um, it's a performance, not not a uh, real time um, real time reactions, uh, but it gives you a completely um, different understanding of what is happening. Um, in the scene than we had when we had members of the general public go behind and um, follow a strict set of movement instructions. And our point here is really that it's not enough to just learn how to, to physically move your body or physically move the drone, but having an understanding of the context and what you're trying to get across and the feeling that you're trying to um, create, whether that is in an artistic performance or in other situations in which we may be interacting with um, semi-autonomous systems or drone systems is really at the heart of what we're trying to understand. So, uh, what we are beginning to think quite a bit more about, and I have two weeks worth of videos. I've got about 300 pictures per day. I have a huge number of transcripts to get through and to begin to do the real analysis in this project is that relationships are becoming with or relating with a robotic system really involves both lots of practice and lots of attention and being in the moment that requires attention, communication, and um, feedback. And also that designing and acting these relationships requires a plurality of intelligences and a plurality of skills and expertise, that it's not kind of enough to have just one person on the team do all of the programming, but this incredible amount of uh, back and forth between the performers and the various choreographers. Um, and with that, I want to just say um, thank you. If you have questions or ideas for collaborations or partnerships, please do reach out to us. I have email addresses here for me and for Mina and for Zhuang Ying. Um, I encourage you to join conversation with us uh, at our website and also to learn more about Lucy. Um, there's a documentary being made about the project as well, and you can see clips from that um, at the website that is listed here. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. My timer stopped working, so I either spoke for 25 minutes or three hours. I apologize if I went over time. You did great, Alex. You're all good. All right, so we are going to open up the floor for questions. Um, I've got Kathy monitoring on Zoom. If you uh, want to ask questions via Zoom, you can put it in the chat or you can use the raise hand function. And Kathy, please um, tell me verbally if there are questions there. And in the room, I will be here uh, to answer any video call on you, basically. Any questions? So thank you for the interesting talk, first of all. Um, uh, sorry, because it's hybrid, I'm going to ask you to come up towards uh, the microphone. I'm really sorry. It'll be a little bit of a jumble, um, but it might just be a little bit easier for Alex to hear. Oh, yes. So that people Thank you. People who are not here will know who is okay. Yeah. Um, and I should just note everybody in the room, the Zoom will be recorded. So um, if that's an issue, let me know. So I stand here? Is this okay? Yes, this is perfect. Perfect. Okay, so my name is Emma van Zulen. I'm a PhD student at Delft University of Technology. Mm -hmm. um, so first of all, thanks for the cool talk. Uh, I always very much like these kind of projects. So you said that um, in the work that you did, the drones were hard-coded, right? Mm -hmm. 
So do you currently also have plans for doing experiments with drones that are actually interactive to see how that influences this like back and forth and process of becoming with? Yeah, it's a great question, Emma. Thank you. Um, at the moment, no. Our, um, our, uh, the scope of this project is that, that the Australasian Dance Collective has a project that they're doing, and we are interested in working with them to explore models of relationships and how those could be realized on stage. So yes, it would be um, really awesome to be doing some of this with um, non-pre-programmed drones. And Mina Hennen, who is on the team, is a roboticist. So it could be possible in the future for us to do a future project building on this that does this, but it's out of scope for the, for the current work. And I'm also thinking about the work health and safety stuff and the ethics things that I'll have to get through to uh, make that research possible. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm yes. groaning a little bit, but it is a good question. Yeah, I think, uh, well, uh, in, in the past, uh, I've tried like going from, well, you have hard coded and then you have like Wizard of Oz and then to try to go beyond that. But it's a challenge. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions, either online or here? <laughs> Uh, Liz, we have a question from Felicity on Zoom. Uh, Felicity has posted in chat, so I'm going to ask uh, the question on Felicity's behalf. So Felicity has asked, when I think of becoming with and relating with, I often think of the concepts of joint attention and shared attention in parent and child dyads, the notion that they are both paying attention to or exploring something in the environment together. How does the environment come into this? And Felicity is curious how human robot dyads might simultaneously interact with an environmental object to display the different ways they interact or to engage with it. Uh, Alex, could you comment on that? Definitely. Um, thank you so much, Felicity, for the question. Um, I think it is a good one. We are certainly um, looking at um, a variety of literature to help us think about what a, what dyad relationships are and what are different models for them, um, including ones between um, parent and children. Um, I do like bringing the, the context or the environment um, or other uh, agents or non-agents that are present um, into that conversation, into that relationship. Um, the uh, costuming and the scene setting and the lighting and everything else, uh, that body of work is happening in a few months. So I will be um, back up uh, with the creative team at the ADC having conversations about that. And I think that's kind of when we'll be able to explore this, those questions more. So I will reach out to you and um, I would love to uh, hear more about how you think about those things. Okay. Saw the thumbs up. <laughs> Are you Alex? Any other questions? All right, Alex, I've got a question for you. I'm I'm yes. curious to to whether the work that you have been doing on this project has changed your thinking at all about uh, what human machine collaboration might look like um, and how you might think about uh, using that. Uh, new perspective in future products. Mm, in future products? Projects. Or Projects. Okay, I was like, oh, am I my Intel, am I Intel hat or my Andy <laughs> hat? I was like, she could have been asking me that from that background. Um, also, a, a, a really good question. And then I got so flustered by the Intel or ANU that I forgot what I was going to answer. So give me just a, a moment. Um, can you repeat the question since I got flustered? Yeah, so that's okay. Um, so first of all, you can use your ANU or Intel hat either okay. way. I'm really interested in how, uh, whether or how this project has changed your view of human machine collaboration and how that might impact how you think about future projects. Um, certainly, I think the, the um, I'm kind of um, infamous for this, so I'll just own it. Um, I tend to do research and any time that I talk to someone that has 
um, knowledge that I don't have, whether it's like how to do laundry in a tiny Hong Kong apartment or whether it's like how to, you know, program a, a drone to act in a particular way. Um, I end up calling that person my new favorite. And I can see Kathy Reed laughing already about that. Um, so I'm delighted by just understanding um, all of the different knowledge that comes into this. And it's making me realize that um, there's so much to be learned about the non-discursive relationships or non-discourse based relationships that we have with systems around us. Um, and there's kind of attention um, to the body and attention to how we move. And I've always been kind of, you know, everyone read Edward Hall, Edward T. Hall as an undergrad and was like, oh, proxemics, kinesics, amazing, right? But this is the first time that I've got to really think in a very deep way about that. Um, because a lot of my earlier work has been around um, AI systems that involve speech or involve text. And here, there's none of that. It's all about expression through um, the body. Uh, and I realized uh, just also how amazing dancers are and um, their control over their bodies is completely different than anything I encounter in my daily life. Um, so, yeah, it, it makes me think very, very much differently about uh, the non-discursive and the kind of the embodied um, in human machine collaboration. Any questions before I ask a follow-up? Okay, I might. I, I want to ask about that the embodied experience. I mean, you're, you're talking about the answers, and I'm kind of curious about how this uh, might apply in other domains. So for example, if you're thinking about um, interacting with, it could be drones, it could be other types of, of embodied um, uh, machinery, I guess. Yep. Uh, how might um, what you've learned here relate to, how might it inform how you would think about, for example, training people to work with machines in various other environments? Um, I think it's, it's, thank you again for that question. Um, while I have, as I've said, like my new favorite people on earth are drone choreographers, dance choreographers, dancers, et cetera. Um, my interest in the project is really um, to think about how art can inform everything that we do or provide models for um, other contexts. So I'm a little less concerned about like, does it fly or not fly? Is it a drone or is it a robotic system that's on the floor or on a wall or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, and so I think uh, the thing that it changes there is that it's not really about, um, uh, it's about shifting the conversation from training people to work with systems that are a bit rigid and that you have to adapt yourself to them, to thinking about how do you, create in the, the training of the systems and the training of the people, a kind of uh, mutual coming together and uh, mutual attention in the way that, or shared attention or joint attention in the way that Felicity asked the question about earlier. Okay, thank you, Alex. Uh, Lauren has a follow up here. And Kathy, are there uh, questions online that I should be aware? Uh, there's no questions online, but I do have a question for Alex when we have a moment. Okay. Uh, Great. I'll let Lauren go first, and then Kathy, you next. Hi, Alex. Hello. So I'm curious about this, the whole um, embodiment, and then the comments you made earlier about the language challenges in terms mm -hmm. of, you know, the people designing the robots and the dancers trying to find a common language. So has it been that um, at the end of the day, are they still trying to translate this embodiment into words in order to do the translation or is there actually an experimentation in how they communicate non-verbally as a team I yeah suppose. yeah uh thank you loren yeah it's it's amazing to me i think at some point in day two when um they were doing feedback on a on a run of a of a sequence and amy is talking the human the dance choreographer is talking to the drone choreographer and the dancer is literally like just keeps moving around them like the other thing i learned is that dancers move all the time right like i have no <laughs> idea they have that much energy but they're always moving um and i i finally realized um and this shows my biases i was like oh 
like that dancer is basically a human PowerPoint. Like every time Amy is trying to explain something, that dancer is enacting the part of the sequence that they're trying to get the drone choreographer to understand. And so a lot of it isn't um, isn't just words, it's visual and the kind of getting people to be in a different time or a different sequence of activities while they're still sitting here having a kind of language conversation. Um, and the other thing that uh, really came up in that way is um, that, that it turns out that some of that doesn't even help the drone choreographers, that they are attuned to, because the drone choreographers, and I mentioned I said this and I come back to it, the drone choreographers are not just kind of roboticists or, or control engineers, right? Um, they actually have backgrounds in the arts and they have backgrounds working at, um, in uh, entertainment companies, like large entertainment companies, for example. And so they are actually thinking about, not just about visually what's happening, but um, auditory cues. And so one of the challenges um, for one of the drone choreographers was that the music that was being used doesn't have verses in a chorus, verses in a chorus, and then they know at what point the drone needs to do something. Instead, it's this, this ambient music and locating themselves in time um, is difficult because they can't do it through auditory and they're still trying to think through what the, the dancer is doing and of course the dancer is doing this human PowerPoint thing. Um, so yeah, it's not just all about language, it's about other types of sound and visual cues. Great, thank And you. we're still really thinking through this, so I'm sorry that I'm, you're hearing kind of everything come out of me, but uh, <laughs> we're, only, we're only a few weeks out of the first round of field work. That's awesome. We can see it. We'll be able to see it evolve, right, as the project goes on. Um, Kathy, you had your question. Would you like to ask it? Uh, thank you so much, Liz, and uh, uh, a huge hello to, to everyone there in Paris. Uh, so, Alex, uh, I'm first of all, an incredible talk. Thank you. I, I just got so much out of it about possible futures that we have as our lives start to collide with all these different systems around us. And it got me thinking that... As human teams, we don't always work well together, even if we have language and even if we have means to communicate. And is your fieldwork showing anything around how we might avoid reproducing relationships with humans that don't necessarily work well, so poor relationships or toxic relationships with humans? How can we avoid having those sorts of relationships with cobots? Mm. That is an excellent question that I can't possibly answer, but I may throw it to uh, Joanying. Um, is it possible to unmute her? Uh, because Joanying's expertise in this project is really in human um, computer or human machine interaction, and in particular, um, uh, how measuring, um, uh, uh, well, she'll tell you what she does. <laughs> I'm going to mess it up, but I'm like, she's, got, she's off mute, she should answer it. Um, thank you, Alex. Um, I think my background is using fit, like humans physiological signal to understand humans' emotions in interacting with machines such as um, computers, robots, and also other things. Um, so sorry, Kathy, I was not like able to list like hear what you are asking. Would you mind if you can repeat what you're asking? Certainly, Shani. Uh, so my question was around sometimes when humans work together, we don't have very good relationships with each other as humans. So how can we avoid reproducing negative relationships or poor relationships when we build relationships with cobots? Yeah, I think my view on this was probably you have seen the videos of um, Amy trying to interact with a drone but the drone is right too close to Amy and it was almost like hitting into uh, an accident. So I think this is how like we, when we interact with humans we initially will have a lot of communications conflicts with each other but as long as we communicate with each other and find a way to be in sync and, and then eventually we'll be able to solve um, the like uh, all kinds of conflicts. So I think this is the same way we apply when we um, like collaborate with like cobots or robots or other like kind of systems where initially we need some process to 
calibrate ourselves and try to sync ourselves with um, the machines. And once that's done, probably it's, I think it's a mutual adaptation to each other. So it's from the human to the machine and also the machine to humans. So Alex, do you have other things to add on? Yeah, I just, I just wanted to say, I thought that was a really nice way of, of saying it. And also that there are just some people that um, uh, are not as attuned to others as others are, right? So like we talked about like mutual attention, we talked about um, feedback and iteration and things like that. Like some systems just don't work that way. And so I don't think we can solve all human um, frictions or conflicts in dyad relationships. Um, I did want to come back to the one final word, and that was I was thinking a lot about um, what Demeth said earlier about um, uh, engineers and being able to communicate across teams. And I was thinking about the, you know, uh, famous Norbert Wiener quote around either the poets will have to become engineers or the engineers will have to become poets. And I think that's really what we're seeing in this type of project, that um, it's not just, uh, you know, artists on one side and engineers on the other, and like bang, 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 they're never going to get along. It actually turns out that the drone choreographers are professional musicians on the side and that Amy Hollingsworth, um, in addition to being like a world-renowned dancer and choreographer, also um, is uh, uh, knows how to fly airplanes like fixed wing, but then moved to rotary. So she's also a helicopter pilot and is now a drone pilot. So there's these kind of mixing of skills that I think that um, is going to become more common and that we should be encouraging more in the types of education that we're offering um, from you know, early childhood onward that will, I think, help with some of some of those things that you were talking about, Kathy. Wow, there's so much in there. There's so much rich uh, information there to unpack. Thank you both. Thank you. Um, we have time for one more question, I think, if you, anyone has one online or here or comments. Uh, nothing online. Okay, nice. Um, hi, Professor Alex, you've made me less afraid of robotics and machines. <laughs> to human, because um, I'm a performance artist and um, I'm exploring the interaction of machine. And I always think this is out of my limits. I don't understand, but actually, your project has given me some light at the end of the tunnel and inspiration to how I can adapt my performance art towards the idea of machines and robotics. So Excellent. thank you. I was terrified because I'm like, it's out my depth. I normally work with very natural materials. I'm very analog -y. Yeah. You know, I'm all about the body, you know, hardcore physical things. So I didn't know what to expect when I found this um, uh, event. I was actually quite excited about it. So um, I'm really thankful you opened like a nice door into something that I would have been normally <laughs> terrified of. <laughs> I'm glad that you could attend. Thank you. An excellent comment. All right. Any other final comments or questions? Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, well, then let's thank Alex again. <laughs> I just ran out of battery. Oh. <laughs> and I plugged in and I thought, oh, it's not charging, but it's going to be okay. So I think that was my that was my exit stage left. <laughs> Technology, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. Well, let's thanks thank Alex again. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk. Thank you. Have a great uh, rest of your day, and thank you for inviting <laughs> me. Thank you.